אוקיי. בשם השם נעשה ונצליח. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Shtabach Shem Olaad. Hashem continues to perform miracles for us. Where uh, it wasn't too long ago where we didn't even know whether the Torah was real, whether Hashem was real, whether anything in life was real. And Baruch Hashem today was surrounded by amazing students, our amazing family, amazing kala with Baruch Hashem two children now. that observe Torah mitzvot ve'gmilut chasadim on a daily basis and uh, like Yaakov Avinu said to Hashem katonti mikol chasadim Hashem you're giving me too much Baruch Hashem so in uh, honor of my new son Ovadia I, uh, I'd like to say a few things and also thank my parents for uh, coming here for holding all of this, making all of this happen, Baruch Hashem. Not only bringing us to the world, but supporting us all the way till today, Baruch Hashem. Thank my brothers for coming from all over the country. Amazing, with their families, with kids. Bezat Hashem, Rak Bismachot. Only celebrations, we see each other, we celebrate Bezat Hashem. My amazing Kala, who has been with me for almost 15 years now, fighting the battles, whether it was on Wall Street, or it was uh, the fight for the Kvod Hashem that we fight every single day. My amazing Kala has never stopped giving. She continues to give the biggest tzaddikah I've ever met. And Mamash, it's, a, it's truly amazing that uh, she's still with me. <laughs> you know, and uh, Baruch Hashem. Also, I'd like to thank all of you, all of my students, my friends, family, all of you for coming. It's truly amazing to see all of you. We had the uh, honor and the schut to have two sets of students, Baruch Hashem, get married in the last week. So, with Zat Hashem, today, after I finish talking, we'll also do Sheva Bachot for them. And the interesting part, and with Zat Hashem, with Siat Nishmaya, we'll try to connect it to why we picked the name of Adya. Now, in one set of the students, we have a Baal Tshuva that actually was my first student. My first student in Florida was Nissan. The first year we ever recorded was just me and him. And I told him, Nissan, Nissan started it all. And really, in the beginning, neither one of us knew what we were doing. I knew a few things in the Torah, not that I know that much now, but I knew a few things. And Nissan was also new. I told him, listen, I'm going to tell you what God said, based on what it's written over here, based on what Chazal says, and you do whatever you want. I'm not going to judge you, you don't want to do it, do it. I'm going to tell you what he says, and you decide for yourself. And we started the first year, just me and him. And originally, it was just supposed to be just me and him, and maybe some other people. We weren't really supposed to record it. But why did we record it? Because at that time, my father... Refuah Shlema, Bezad Hashem, continue to have Refuah Shlema. He actually was in the hospital, and he, um, he told me, listen, I want to, uh, I want to see your shiur. I heard you're doing a shiur. I want to see your shiur. So I said, okay, so I'll, I'll record it. So I took my iPad, I recorded it, and uh, now you have to send it. I thought I could email it, but the file was too big. So I figured, okay, let me try to do this, let me try to do this. I couldn't figure out any other way. I'm like, you know what? Easiest way to do it is put it on YouTube and just send him the link. So that's what I did. I put it on YouTube and I sent him the link. And that was really the only plan was for him to watch it. Maybe my brothers would watch it or something, but that's it. But after a week, I saw that there's other people watching. There's more than one click. I'm like, wow, other people. Like, maybe 15, 20 clicks, 20 people watched this year. And some people even commented. I go, wow, this actually helped other people. So we said, okay, let's record the next year. And Baruch Hashem, two and a half years later, we're reaching over 200,000 people a week, Baruch Hashem. 200,000 people a week from all over the world, from Australia to uh, America, all over the country, all over the world. We even have people in Africa, in Tahiti, in Bali, and all these, I even have people in Afghanistan. Bombay. Mamash, in Bombay. I mean, it's unbelievable. Shtabach Shem and we have amazing people in India. We have Baruch Hashem, and we have amazing people like some of our students, Baruch Hashem, that are helping us 
get to reach people, spread it on the internet, do everything they can. Each one of these helpers, Baruch Hashem, there's so many of them that Ken Yirbu will have many, many more even, but they continue to publicize the Torah, whether it's Facebook or it's Twitter or it's this or it's that. We're constantly reaching more and more people and there's constantly more messages and more people doing tshuva, more people converting, more people getting closer and closer to Hashem Barach, and it's changing their life. And this is all teamwork. But of course, all of it starts with Bezrat Hashem. That's what we call the company, the organization Bezrat Hashem, because it's all about Bezrat Hashem. So we have the first student that started it all. And as the Rav said earlier today, that when the first person that shows up to Minyan, the first person, he gets the schut for the entire Minyan. It's like he prayed ten times. Rav Aon Zev, Baruch Hashem, is a huge Talmud Chacham. We've learned so much from him, we continue to learn from him, we had the schut. And uh, thanks to my father, Baruch Hashem, to bring him here, to be the Mo'el, to give us some divrei Torah. Him and his Rabbanit have really influenced our life in a, such a big way. It's just, honestly, you just sit next to him, you do tshuva. You don't have to do anything. Just sit next to him, you do tshuva. Amazing. So, you learn things just by listening to what he says. Regular conversation. And that's actually what the Gemara says. Gemara says, aside from learning from the books, and aside from learning from the lectures, it's very important for each person to connect themselves to a tzaddik and stay next to him. Just listen to how he handles his life, how he goes to the store, how he treats his kids, how he treats his wife, even how he goes to the bathroom. Because you have to be modest. You have to be modest when you go to the bathroom. You can't be like an uh, animal. So when you sit next to Aaron Zeev, Baruch Hashem, Rabbi Aaron Zeev is such an amazing midot, you already do tshuva at least one or two midot every two minutes. So now, this was one set of students, Baruch Hashem, two and a half years ago, he told me that the, uh, he wants to get married, Bezat Hashem. And we had the privilege, Baruch Hashem, to see the wedding just in, uh, yesterday. Yesterday, Baruch Hashem had the wedding, and it's uh, amazing. The funny thing is about this wedding, uh, the Siyat Nishmaya, is that they tell me that they've been next door neighbors the whole time. They just never knew each other existed. Until Hashem wanted them to see it. Just like when Hagar, the uh, Shifcha of Avraham Avinu, when she went into the desert, she started crying to Hashem, there's no water. So Hashem said, sent her angels. He said, look, look, there's a well over here. And Chazal say, you know, the well was always there. He, Hashem didn't create a well. It was right there the whole time. But she didn't see it. Why? Because you could only see things if Hashem allows. It could be right next to you, but you can't see it sometimes. So you have to have the siyat dishmai to see even something that's right in front of you. The other couple, Baruch Hashem, both amazing students, one Baal Tshuva, one a convert, and this is the one that I told you about, that we went to the Bed Din. The Bed Din was so impressed at how much she knew that they kept asking a question. They said, you already, you already passed the test, but we just want to know how much you know. And they continued asking. Five minutes later, she was already finished. But they continued asking her questions. It became like a chavruta for an hour and a half. An hour and a half sitting with the Bet Din, asking questions just to see how much she knows. And after we finished the conversion, an amazing day, we all went to go pray. What is she doing? I see she's reading a book. What book? Mesilat Yesharim. Find me, find me people like this. Find me more people like this. Ashrei Am Yisrael. You know, it's, it's mamash amazing. She's reading Mesilat Yesharim after the conversion. You know, after conversion, you usually want to relax, go to sleep. I don't know, go celebrate. What do you do? Dream of Shilat Yesharim. Tzadikah, Baruch Hashem. And the tzaddik that's with us also now, he actually is working with us at Bezrat Hashem, helping us on a daily basis, Baruch Hashem. So, Baruch Hashem, we have privilege to see and be part of amazing lives, amazing tshuva stories. Now, many people that know the name of Adya, Immediately think of Ovadia Yosef, Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, Zechet Tzadik ve Kadosh Livracha, who we lost just a few years ago. And everyone knows whether you're Ashkenazi or Sephardi or whatever you are, everyone knows, everyone agrees, he was one of the giants of giants, one of the giants of all generations. But there's also a prophet Ovadia. 
And many people don't know the story of Prophet Ovadia because it's not such a big book. It's actually in your basic Tanakh, maybe one page, two pages. It's one nevuah, it's one prophecy of what's going to happen at the end of times of how Hashem is going to punish the enemies of Israel. The enemies of Israel. Well, Hashem, we have many enemies we've collected through the last few thousand years. And Hashem is told Ovadia, the prophet Ovadia, how he's going to punish them. But who is this Ovadia? Why did he get such a schut to become a prophet? Why did he get such a schut to have one of the 24 books in the Torah about his life? I don't have a book. There's no book, says Yaron. There's no book. He has a book. Why? So Ovadia originally wasn't Jewish. Ovadia was actually working at the kinghood, the kingdom of the Oivim, of the enemies. Where the king, the wicked king, decided after listening to his wife Izevil to kill all the prophets. Kill all the prophets of Am Yisrael. And Ovadia, despite being a non-Jew, was a general at the enemy's uh, army, but he knew the value of the Torah. He knew the significance of Hashem. He knew that Torah Moshe is emet. He knew he had to protect the Torah. So he did what every one of us has to do every day. He did something called Mesirut Nefesh. He put his life on the line for Hashem. And yes, that's what I said. Every one of us has to put our life on the line for Hashem every day. Why? Because Hashem gave you life. It's the least you can do is give Him back. Honor His name with your life. So Vadya took 100 prophets and he hid them. Putting his life on a line. Now, the Torah doesn't forget about finances. You have to feed these people. So the Torah also told us that he had to go borrow money to feed these hundred prophets, hundred holy prophets. He had to go borrow money with interest. Who did he borrow money from? The wicked king's son. Which is actually one of the ways we learn that money doesn't have any friends. Because even though his father wanted to kill everyone, as soon as the son heard that he could make some money out of it, he didn't tell his father. Bribery can even fool the wise, and of course it fools the wicked every day. So he borrowed money from this person. Eventually the time came, we had to pay it back. But he had no money. So this wicked person came to him and said, listen, you don't have any money. I'll just take your children instead. I'll take your children to become slaves. Now, Ovadia, if he was one of us, most likely you say, you know what, don't take my kids, don't take anything, thank you very much, take the hundred prophets. I tried, guys, but I'm sorry. I'm not going to give you my kids. Okay, I love Hashem. Ad Khan, up to here. I love Hashem. I protected a hundred prophets. I borrowed some money. But now you want to take my kids? Okay, no, no thank you. Take the hundred prophets. Oh, you know what? Take 50 and 50 next week. Maybe I'll get some, maybe I'll get a down payment. But for Kvod Hashem, for Kvod Hashem to continue, to continue the lineage, to continue getting direct messages from Hashem Barach, He gave him his children. He gave him the children just to make sure that we have more prophets, that we have more of a connection to Hashem Barach, And as a schal, as a reward for this extraordinary misuhut nefesh, Hashem blessed him with prophecy. He made him a prophet. He said, you protect the prophets, midah kedeged midah. Measure for measure, I'll make you a prophet. You honor my prophets, I'll make you a prophet. And with that schut, he became one of the few people that's mentioned in the Torah. And we had prophecy for many, many more years because of him. And obviously he converted, became a Ger Tzedek. Now, Rav Ovadia, Zecher Tzadik Livacha, 
was very similar in different ways. There's many Chachamim in Am Yisrael. There's many Chachamim. Baruch Hashem, there's no shortage of Chachamim. There's no shortage of Chachamim, whether they're secular or religious. There's many Chachamim. There's many people that are wise. Even in the Torah world, even today, there's many Chachamim. One of the sages say that even today, we have people with wisdom like the Geonim. But because they have bad Midot, Hashem doesn't show them how much wisdom they have. So there's many people that have Chokhmah. Rabbi Vadya wasn't alone with Chokhmah. But what made our Rav Ovadia special? What made him so special? Our Rav Ovadia didn't just fear Hashem. Our Rav Ovadia didn't just study his Torah. Our Rav Ovadia lived his Torah. And he was zealous for Hashem 24 hours a day. He was not only a Ishemet in his house. He was not only a Ishemet in the yeshiva. He was a Ish Emet all the time. If there was no Emet, he had to get in the way. He had to bring Emet back in there. He had a very good job being one, part of the Beddin in Egypt. Amazing job. Good finances. A lot of kavod. Everything and anything he wanted. He had lectures every day. For a young guy. One day he finds out that the Jewish hospital is selling non is, is uh, feeding everyone including the doctors non-kosher food this is to him this is ridiculous so he came to them and he said listen you obviously have to you made a mistake maybe you have to bring kosher food said no we have to go to the board we have to go to the board of directors Hashem Rachem, we had already board already 80 years ago the the biggest disaster that ever happened to Judaism is making boards of directors because usually the boards of directors are a bunch of chilonim, a bunch of people who don't really care about Hashem. They just want position, they want kabod. They want respect. So that's exactly what happened. This, this uh, board of directors for this uh, Bet Cholim, for this uh, hospital, was a bunch of people who didn't really care about Hashem. They just cared about kabod, they cared about money. So they brought it to them and said, no, listen, kosher food is too expensive. So it's expensive, no expensive, it's just a Jewish hospital, you have to feed people kosher food. Long story short, the fight continued, eventually got to the point where Rabbi Vadya says, listen, it's either you feed these people kosher food, or I am leaving the job. I quit. What do you quit? I mean, you don't have to eat the food. You're not in the hospital, Baruch Hashem. What do you care? What do you care if they eat non-kosher food? Some of them are sick. Some of the doctors, the doctors want to be Rashaim, let them be Rashaim. The patients don't have any choice. What do you care so much that you're going to put your job, your livelihood, your honor, your respect on the line for them? What do you care about them so much? Because Avadiah knew and believed every single word in the Torah. And he said that each and every single one of us is connected to Am Yisrael. Each and every single one of us is responsible for our neighbor even if we don't know his name. You're Jewish, he's Jewish, you're responsible for what he does. You can't just let him continue being a sinner without ever saying a word. That's why one of the 613 mitzvot in the Torah is amitecha. Make sure to rebuke and repro reprove your brother if you see him making a mistake. Whether he's Mechal Shabbat, or he's angry, or he doesn't know how to keep kosher, whatever it is. You have to rebuke your brother. Of course, it also says, Veloti Salav Chet, don't bring yourself to sin by rebuking anyone, by starting to yell at them in the middle of the street, or start throwing rocks at them like some crazy people do. You have to rebuke them in a certain way. But the point being is that you have to make sure that you say something. Rav Vadya didn't only say something, he did something. Eventually, he quit his job. They tried bringing him back. They promised him that they're going to change. He saw that they're not changing and eventually he left. Many years later, 
he was giving shiurim every Shabbat. At some point he was giving six, seven shiurim every Shabbat. If we do six, seven shiurim every month, it's already a miracle. He did six, seven shiurim only on Shabbat. <coughs> and one time he left the shiur, got out of the, you know, finished the shiur. As soon as he finished the shiur, boom, a ball hits him in the face. And his turban falls off. Obviously, this is not a, a very uh, pleasing event. But Rav Vadya picks up his hat, looks at who did it. He said, come here for a second, come. And he sees it's one of the neighborhood kids, a troublemaker. What would you do if somebody just kicked the ball in your face, and most likely on purpose? Maybe make him eat the ball. Rav Vadya says to him, he says, did you eat today? Did you eat? The little boy says, no, I didn't eat. Because you want to eat at my house? The kid said, eat's the one that told the story. He said, yeah, sure, I'm actually hungry. Oh, come with me. So he takes him to his house, and he gives him food. And he eats. And he says, you want more? He says, yeah, I want more. And he gave him more food. And the boy says, later on I found out that I actually took his food. Because Rav Vadya wasn't, wasn't rich. He was very, very poor. There was only enough for him and his wife. And he gave him his meal. He gave him his food. For this little boy, he doesn't even know that I kicked the ball in his face. So he said, you're tired? You want to rest maybe? So okay, I'll rest. So he went and rested. Shabbat was over. And Rav Vadya says, okay, what do you want to do now? He adopted this little boy already. What do you want to do now? He goes, I want to, I want to go to the cinema. Okay, you have money for the cinema? He goes, no, I don't have any money. Kids as poor as it gets. He goes, what is it? One lira. And again, like I said, Ravadi himself is poor. He's like, oh, I'm going to give you one lira, but you have to promise me that next week you make sure that everyone else is over there is quiet when I'm giving a shoe. And you come back to me and you eat with me again next week. For sure, yes, for the Rav, I'll do it. Okay, he gave him the lira, he went to the cinema, and the next week, as soon as Rav Vadya comes to the shul, the boy is already ready, he's like, hey, for the Rav, everyone's going to be quiet. I'll make sure everybody's quiet over here. The Rav gave the shul, comes out of the shul, the boy is excited and waiting for having a meal with the Rav, he doesn't even know who he's talking to, Bichlal. he's just, you know, the Rav gave him food. And he goes with him, and he eats with him, and little by little he starts learning with him. And although the book, this is one of uh, the stories that's actually in the bio of Rav Vadya, the book doesn't say the name because of the honor of who this person came to be. They say that the little boy became one of G'dolei Ado, one of the heads of the Beddin in Israel. Why? Because Rav Vadya cared. That's it. All you have to do is care a little bit. One of the giants of the generations once said that the biggest sinat chinam that we still have till today is when one Jew sees another Jew making a sin and doesn't say anything. Rabbi Yonatan Aibishit says this because he says, everyone thinks that Sinat Chinam is the, because maybe the Ashkenazi doesn't like the Sephardi, or the Sephardi doesn't like the Ashkenazi, or the Litvish doesn't like this. No, no, that's not Sinat Chinam. The Sinat Chinam, the biggest one we still have, is when we see each other, Mechalel Shabbat, not eating kosher, not doing this, not doing that, we don't say anything. That's Sinat Chinam. Why? Because one of you knows that it's a problem. Someone's a Mechalel Shabbat, in essence, what he's doing, every time he turns on the car, he's turning on an atomic bomb in his Olam Abba. So one day he's going to get to this Olam Abba, after 120, and he sees only destruction. He says, hey, what kind of Olam Abba is this? You said in the Gemara, Masechet Sanhedrin, 
כל ישראל יש להם חלק לעולם הבא, ישראל אין להם חלק לעולם הבא. What, what kind of Olam Abba is this? Destruction, destruction, destruction. What is this? The building, there used to be a nice building here. Oh yeah, yeah, destroyed. It turned into lava instead. What happened? What kind of Olam Abba is this? Because yeah, you did it. When? And they're going to show him a movie. Show him a movie of all the atomic bombs. He ignited himself every time he turned on the car, played with the phone, ripped paper, all the different things of Shabbat that we are not allowed to do. You created yourself. So now if you know, Baruch Hashem, you know how to keep Shabbat, you're learning Alachot Shabbat, you're observing Shabbat, you have a friend, you have a family, doesn't keep Shabbat, you tell them, listen, come eat. You hungry? You eat anyway, right? It's free. Don't worry, I won't charge you for the food. You eat anyway. Either way you eat. Whether it's Shabbat or it's Yom Shani, it doesn't make a difference. You eat, right? So come to my house and eat. And once they get to your house, try to keep them there for as long as possible. Give them some chewing so they fall asleep till Motzei Shabbat. <laughs> Give as much kosher food as possible. Eventually the kosher food will turn into their blood and eventually they're going to give you enough time to bring them back to Hashem. But sometimes you have to convince people in different ways. But that was the gdula of Arab Ovadia. Regardless of how big he was, regardless of the fact that he already knew more Torah when he was 10 years old than probably most people in the world today. When he was 10 years old, his father took him to Baghdad with him and little Ovadia went to the Kolel and he was sitting down with a bunch of old men overhearing their shiu. And uh, eventually he says to them, you know, that uh, what you're saying right now is wrong. You're not understanding the Mishnah correctly. So one of the older men said, hey, hey, chatsuf, hey, rude little person, you 10 years old are going to tell us how to study. One of the other ones was actually a Talmud Chacham. He said, hey, hey, hold on a second. His 10-year-old said that we're wrong. Maybe he's right. How are we wrong? How are we wrong? And Rav Ovadia says, little Ovadia now, 10 years old. He says, yeah, the Tosfot, which is one of the commentaries, actually what he says, and he starts reciting it by heart. By heart. The Tosfot. This is commentary on commentary. This is like, you know, the small print? This is the small print on the small print. He remembers that by heart. Immediately one of the older men got off the chair and started running. Ran out of the yeshiva looking for the head rav. He says to him one of the sayings that's in the Gemara, where Resh Lakish says to Rab uh, Rabban Yochanan, a lion came from Israel to Bavel. This little 10 year old. And the head rough comes to him and he says, You study Mishnah? Nah, just a little bit. Because in the Gemara, Baba Metzia, it says that you're allowed to lie about how much you know, meaning to be humble, to say you know less than what you really do. This I also learned from Rav Zev. So, he asked him, how much do you know? No, I don't know, just a few Mishnayot. What Mishnah did you uh, learn? He goes, no, nothing, small, small. But which one? Tell me, tell me, which one? He goes, no, just a little Nezikim, just a little small, this one. What other one? What other one? No, just a little this one. Oh, just a little this one. And he sees that they're not letting it go, so he has to keep telling them. He can't lie outright. You have to, he's trying to steer him a different way, but the Rob is very, very smart, and he's not letting it go. And little by little, they just discovered that he just finished the entire Shas, the entire Mishnah. He says, what about Gemara? Do you finish any Gemara? No, only a little bit, not much Gemara. Which Gemara? Just a little Bava Kama. Or just a little Bava Metzia. Just a little bit. Before you know it, you already finished half the Shas of the Gemara. Ten years old. And he stayed in Baghdad for the next six months and the people that were there, who said the story eventually, they all did Aliyah to Israel. The people there said that for the next six months, this 10 year old Ovadia, he was our rabbi. He would give us a shiur every day, 10 years old. And he continued being zealous for Hashem, continued being an Ishemet, not just learning, but implementing it. Trying to help the Gdolei Adol and trying to help the common man. The little guy, the little kid with a 
tank top, playing soccer on Shabbat, and not really knowing what the purpose of life is. The average Joe that is a, runs a uh, truck or delivers milk or works at a grocery store, you bring all of them every night to Ishiu. An hour, two hours, three hours, you would teach them. And eventually, he said, the biggest reward I ever got in this world is seeing that their children all became Tamidim Chachamim. All became Tamidim Chachamim. Why? Because he cared. But sometimes caring has a cost. Sometimes caring and showing that you're zealous for Hashem, that you love Hashem, makes other people call you crazy. Makes other people call you fanatic. Makes other people want to kill you. And this is actually what Rav Avadya experienced throughout his entire life. They tried killing him several times. They called him names. They wrote articles against him. Even at the end of his days, it got to a point when he was in his 80s. One guy that never ever met him, journalist, famous journalist, decided to write an article. Why should anyone listen to Rav Avadya anymore? He's already too old, he probably forgot everything. Probably senile. What are you going to listen to this old man for? Because this journalist is used to secular mentality. Where the Gemara says, when someone is not connected to the Torah, the older they get, the more of a baby they become. When someone is a Tamit Chacham, the older they get, the wiser and sharper they become. So this guy never read this Gemara. So he says, yeah, he probably forgot everything already. He probably is not like he used to be. So even though Rav Vadya never really cared about articles or anything like that, he actually cared about this one. He said, you know what, why don't you invite this guy to my house? Come to the head Rav of Israel's house. Immediately the guy came. And uh, he says, then yes, you, uh, I saw you wrote an article about me. And he said that I forgot everything. What made you, th what made you say that? Did, did I tell you that? Because no, you never said it. So what made you think that I forgot everything? Because come on, you know, for the Rav, with all due respect, you know, you're older, it's, you're already over 80 years old. Everybody forgets everything already when they're 70. I'm giving you credit. Like he's doing him a tova. He's doing him a favor. He goes, okay, let's test. Can we test it? But no, for the Rav, you know, I don't want to embarrass you. You don't need to test anything. It's fine. I already wrote the article. What do you care? He goes, but can we test it? Do you care? It doesn't cost you anything. It's free. Okay, well, how do you want to test it? He goes, look at my library. Some say there was 20,000. Some say there's 60,000 books. I don't really know. All I know is there's many, many thousands. Tens of thousands of books in his library. There was no walls. Big house, no walls. And... He says, pick any book you want, any one of them, doesn't matter which one, just tell me the title of the book, open the book anywhere you want, and just don't tell me the page, just anywhere, tell me the first word, first word, that's it. And the guy said, listen, even if you had good memory, even if you were 25 years old, not 85 years old, 25 years old, it's still ridiculous. Even a computer doesn't remember that. You type on a computer, it takes at least a few minutes to figure something like that out. But anyway, fine, to entertain you, I'll go do it. So he goes, he thinks maybe it's a trick. So he climbs the ladder to try to get one of the books all the way in the back that still has dust on it, so he knows. He has, obviously, if he has dust on it, he hasn't touched it in many years, at least many months. So he picks a book all the way in the back, gives him the title, opens the book, and Rav Vadya repeats every single word on that page and continues and continues. He says, oh, wait, hold on a second. This is not normal. Let's try another one. And he picks another book somewhere else. Maybe it was a trick. Opens the book, and Rav Vadya repeats every single word verbatim on the page. The journalist was so amazed, he had to write another article. He says in this new article, not only was I wrong, which is first time in history, by the way, any journalist ever said they were wrong. Not only was I wrong about his memory, but the memory actually has is not human. It's not human. 
And Rav Avadya was as sharp as can possibly be until his last day, and he fought for the truth until his last day. If he saw there was Rashaim, even if there were heads of government, when the head of the government of Israel, the head, number one, did something against Am Yisrael, he cursed him in public. He said, may he sleep and never wake up. And that's what happened. He went to a coma for many years and eventually died. It didn't matter if he was big, he was rich, he was small, it doesn't make a difference. If we're not for Hashem, what do we have? And that's one thing that we always have to remind ourselves. Every day we cry to Hashem, give me panasa, give me health, give me zivug, give me good job, give me shlom bayit, give me car, Give me this, give me that, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Okay, fine, give me, pseudel. You want Hashem to give you, it's the only way you're going to get it anyway, Hashem is going to give it to you. But you ever ask yourself the question, what are you giving Him? What are you giving Hashem? Tefillah, it's for you. Tefillah, every time you pray, you're not helping Him. You're helping you. You're saying thank you. Saying thank you. That's it. If somebody gave you a drink right now, what are you going to say? Thank you. So if somebody gave you life, you should also say thank you. So it's for you. Doesn't make you good. Just makes you normal. If you learn some Torah, it's also for you. Why? To connect to him. If you're not connected to him, what do you have? Bobkis. You have nothing. So it's also for you. Children, for you. He already has millions and millions and millions. It's for you, the ch children. What are you doing for him? And that's one of the things that we can all do, which is care a little bit. Care a little bit about our neighbor. And the one major similarity that you have between the convert and the Baal Tshuva is in essence they're both exactly the same. The Baal Tshuva and the convert are exactly the same, if they're real. And the reason why is because before the Ger, before the convert became a, gun, a convert, could have been anything, could have been an wor idol worshiper, could have been a, uh, just a Noahide, could have been righteous, could have been not righteous, could have been anything. There's some righteous non-Jews, there's some righteous, there's some uh, not, you know, wicked ones. The Jew, on the other hand, before he had Hashem, he couldn't be righteous. There's no such thing as righteous without Hashem. But in essence, what the Shulchan Aruch says in seven places, and also the Gemara, and the Zohar, and also the five books of Moses, is that when a Jew violates Shabbat, he's actually considered a wicked non-Jew. He's considered an idol worshiper. So in essence, when a Jew does tshuva, He's in essence doing the same exact thing as the convert. Only thing is, he doesn't have to go, have to go in front of the Bedin. He's got it easy. He doesn't have to call me in the middle of the night and say, Hey, can you go to the Bedin? He doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to send me an email with the whole life story. He doesn't have to learn every single thing in the world just to become Jewish. He already had the schut to be Jewish when he was born. Or she was born. So we have to take advantage of it. So when a Jew does tshuva and he comes back to Hashem he starts fresh he starts clean he's like a baby <coughs> when a couple gets married and they have a kosher chupay and kiddushim like both of these amazing couples have with no balagan it's against Hashem doing everything what Hashem said then one of the presents that Hashem promises is to wipe away their sins Make them both like babies. That's why everybody asks them for blessings. Because they're clean. So whether you're a convert, you're a Baal Tshuva, now that you're here, there's only one other thing that Hashem asks you. Just one other thing. Oh Hashem, you took care of your soul. Oh Hashem, you got married. Oh Hashem, you're learning a little bit. You're keeping a little bit. Good. You're doing what you're supposed to do. 
There's only one last thing that Hashem asked you to do, which is what Ovadia did. Whether it's the Prophet Ovadia or Rav Ovadia Zechet Tzadiyuvacha. Protect the honor of Hashem by caring just a little bit. Care just a little bit about your neighbor, about your friend, about your brother, about your father, about your sister, about your somebody in the kila you don't even know their name. And sometimes even about your Rav, who well, maybe he's making a mistake. Remind them, by the way, this is not allowed. This is not okay. Do tshuva. Come back to Hashem. Do what Ovadia did, whether it's the Prophet or the Gdol Ado. And Bezrat Hashem, my son. Do that. Show a little careness for Hashem Barach. And Bezrat Hashem, you fulfill your mission in this world. And we should all see the Mashiach in our day. Bezrat Hashem. Bekarov. Yeah.